All right, thanks so much, Makoto and team. Beautiful. I think we should sing Christmas carols all year round, right? Why do we have to say them for like one time a year? We'd probably, maybe we'd get sick, tired of them. I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, so if those of you missed the first introduction, my name is Sean. Um, if you're here for the first time, um, Welcome. We're glad that you are here. Uh, we're actually concluding our, uh, this series, God With Us, on Christmas Eve. We have a kind of a standalone message, but uh, so we're going to try to wrap this up tonight. Um, you know, if you've been here with us the last week, we've been talking about this, this, this reality of, of Emmanuel, of God with us. Um, so to get us started, I'm just going to read um, the, the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, where the story, where this text kind of comes from, um, where we get this idea of God with us. And so if you have a copy of the scriptures, open up to Matthew chapter 1, um, and uh, we'll pick it up in verse 19. Um, the verses will be up on the, up on the screen here. This is what it says. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Someone say, wow. wow. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." All of this took place to fulfill the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. And everyone says, which means what? God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him to, to do. He took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Let's, let's take a minute just to pause and pray. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you would just communicate this reality of Emmanuel to us, this incredible mystery of the incarnation, of the God of all creation, wrapping himself in flesh and bone and blood and coming to earth to be with us. So open up our hearts tonight, Father, to receive what the Spirit has. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. Um, let me just kind of test, maybe create some common ground here, see how we're doing it with this. How many of you would say, like, you've had situations in your life um, where you really needed God to show up? Would you just raise your hand? You really needed God to show up. You were, like, at the end of yourself. All right, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. I just want to, would you look around the room? Like, I think... Just about most of us. Matthew can't raise his hand because he's holding a baby right now, but he probably has both hands raised up. I know his story. Uh, so, I mean, here's the thing. I think all of us, we, 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 you know, have had moments in our lives, and this is kind of crazy. This is probably true for people who don't even believe in God, right? I mean, you know, there's an old saying, it says, uh, there are no atheists in a foxhole. Like, there are times in life, right, when, when things get so hard, when you're just at the end of yourself, where you cry to God even though you don't believe in God. It's like, because that's all there is, right? And so um, I think the, the, the reason is, because I think we, we've recognized, and we've talked about this uh, throughout the series, is that times is, life is hard, right? Life can be incredibly challenging. Um, there, there, there are times in life where we need God to show up in a way, in a very real and tangible way, because we've just come to the end of ourselves. And, and so we've been talking talking about kind of experiencing God in the valleys and in the wilderness seasons of life and in the storms of life. And uh, the good news of the Christmas story is that uh, you don't have to go through the storms and the valleys and the wilderness alone, right? This reality of, of a God who is with us is, is something that uh, we as, as Christians believe and, and we hold to. And, and my hope is that you've actually experienced. It's not just something we believe cognitively, but we've actually sense the very visceral presence of God with us in, in difficult times and seasons of our lives. Um, and, and so the promise of, of, of Scripture is that uh, God will be with us, right? With us through the challenges, with us through the valleys, with us through the storms. Um, and one day we'll eventually 
eventually lead us home, right? And we talked about that when we looked at Psalm 24, right? We're on this pilgrimage to the holy city, to, this, to the new Jerusalem. Uh, the new Jerusalem is spoken about right at the very end of the scripture, right? It's kind of like the hope of the Christian life. And so let me just read it to you so that you know that what, where we're heading, right? This is where we're going as believers, right? Um, the, the apostle John has this vision of, of Jesus and Jesus speaks words of life to him and, and he, he, he writes this for us. He says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Like God, the creator of the universe, is now living with us, and we are living viscerally in his presence. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God. And he himself, right, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Someone say, praise the Lord. Death will be no more, right? Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Behold, behold, Jesus says, I'm making all things new, right? And this is the hope of the Christian life, right? This is the journey that we're on. We, we're, we're on this journey, this pilgrimage to the new Jerusalem, to this place where one day we will live in the very presence of our creator God, right? And, and between now and then, right, um, Jesus has promised to be with us. Even to the very end of the age, he says, in the Gospel of Matthew in 21, the very last words he says, to behold, I'll be with you always, to the very end of the age, right? He has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Um, and this is the good news of Christmas, right? This, this is what Christmas is all about. It's this promise of Emmanuel, the God who is with us, right? Um, this is the good news that, that the, uh, the angel said would cause great joy for all people, right? That this is the good news of the gospel, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us, God with us. You know, there, there are many names um, that the scriptures have for Jesus. Um, you know, um, the, in fact, the, the Greek word um, for, for Jesus, which is kind of a transliteration from the Hebrew, is uh, the Hebrew is Yeshua, which is kind of means Joshua, God who saves. Uh, you know, his name holds just this incredible meaning. You know, and, and Jesus has many other names. Lord of Lords, the Rose of Sharon, right? That's beautiful. Lily of the Valley. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace, alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the lion of the tribe of Judah, light of the world, author of life, the good shepherd, the true vine, the resurrection and the life. Right? And all of these names kind of reveal a character, aspects of Jesus' nature and his character. But the one that, that probably most resonates with me is this, this one, Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. Because this is who Jesus is, right? right? He is the image of the invisible God who is with us. With us. The God who walks through the valley of the shadow of death with us. The God who navigates the storms of life with us. The God who, who walks with us through those barren seasons of wilderness. The God who is with us, Emmanuel. God with us. You know, Charles Wesley, who is one of the great hymn writers and preachers of the 1700s, um, led many, probably thousands, to the Lord through his preaching. Um, on his deathbed, these were his last words. The best of all, God with us. Wesley, the best of all, God with us. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And that statement, God with us, right, it enshrines what is arguably the most controversial of all the Christian truths and doctrines, the things that we believe and hold dear uh, as Christians. And also, you know, arguably one of the most miraculous and beautiful of all the Christian truths that we hold dear to us as believers. And that is the doctrine of the incarnation. And so let me give you a, a definition of, of the incarnation. And this is from that, um, that great you know, wealth and wellspring of wisdom and truth, Wikipedia. Uh, and so <laughs> don't, don't, don't knock it. It was actually a really good definition. This is what it says. It says this, the incarnation of Christ is the central Christian doctrine that God became flesh assumed a human nature, became a man in the form of Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. 
You guys got all that? Got to figure that out, right? So it's more. It says, the divine nature of the Son of God was perfectly united with human nature in one divine person, Jesus, making him both truly God, someone say truly God, and truly man or truly human. Say truly human. The theologic term for this, this is hypostatic union. Uh, the, uh, remember that, I'm going to test you on it after the service. What is it? Hypostatic union, right? This is the merging of the fullness of, of Jesus' divinity with the fullness of his hum- humanity. The second person of the Trinity, God the Son, became flesh when he was miraculously conceived in the, wor- in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So the Apostle John um, describes the incarnation this way. He refers to Jesus as the Logos, the Word. Uh, The the Logos is the reason behind all things. And he says it this way in in the beginning of his gospel. He says, in the beginning, right? Reminiscent of the Genesis account, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And then dropping down to verse 14, uh, John wraps this up and he says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory. John says, I've seen him with my eyes. I was an eyewitness. I saw his glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. And this is, as I said, arguably the most controversial um, of all the Christian doctrines, right? Right? as well as the most mysterious and beautiful of all the things that we hold dear as Christians. And the reason this is so controversial, because at the center of this teaching um, is the unavoidable claim, a claim that at some point every single one of us on this planet will have to come to terms with. And here's the claim. Jesus is God, right? That's at the center of the Christmas story, right? That Jesus is God, and ironically, you know, even though this is kind of the, the center of, of the, the Christmas, Christian message, um, yet today, and as this week progresses towards Christmas, all across this planet, right, billions of people, billions of people, right, will, will, will kind of gather to celebrate. They will buy gifts, and they will decorate trees, and they'll put lights on their tr- trees, and they'll decorate their homes, and they may even sing Christmas carols, all the while kind of avoiding the central claim, right? Or dismissing the central claim. Or worse yet, giving lip service to the central claim that Jesus is God. He is God in the flesh. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a great philosopher. He's not just an excellent human being. He is Emmanuel, God, God. The creator of the universe God with us. God with us. This is what Christmas is all about, right? Christmas is about the fact that we could not, uh, in our own righteousness and effort, get to God, and so God came to us. This is the gift of Christmas, that God literally wrapped himself in flesh and bone and blood and sinew, and he stepped into the mess and the brokenness of our world to be with us. Come on, come on. I mean, like this is, a, this is what Christmas, I mean, it is, it is astounding when you think about it. Like we sing these songs like, oh, holy night. Yeah, it's holy, but it, it is like mind blowing. I'm like, what on earth? The creator of the universe with us, with you, with me. You know, and, and Jesus didn't just come to earth to be with us. That's certainly what he has done. But he actually came on a mission, right? He came to rescue us, right? He came to redeem us, to save us. He came to save you and he came to save me from ourselves, from our sin, from our rebellion, and from eternal separation from the very source of life. He came to rescue us and to save us. He took on flesh to be with us so that he might redeem us and he might save us. And the cost of that redemption, it meant his death. 
Like, come on. Like, it is astounding. It's absolutely astounding. The God of all creation, who with the word speaks forth light and the stars in all their splendor, the galaxies, the planets are formed. And because of his great love for you, for me, for his creation, he steps into our rebellion, into our brokenness, to redeem us and save us. And it costs him his life. Wow. I mean, you, you got to love like the, this Christmas story. I mean, like I love the images of, this, of Christmas. You know, I love the, the story of the nativity, right? The, the angels showing up and the star bright and, and they like see the glory of the angels and they go to the manger in Bethlehem and there they worship Jesus and somehow the wise men get called into that story and they there and they're worshiping Jesus. And it's beautiful, it really is. But oftentimes, right, amidst all the nostalgia of Christmas and all the imagery of Christmas, we miss this incredible proclamation that Jesus is God. He is God. And he is with us. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, just like, I don't even know how to describe that. The one in whom and through whom and for whom all things were created, all things in heaven, all things on the earth, all things under the earth. The God of indescribable might and majesty and splendor who veils himself in unapproachable light, wraps himself in flesh and bone and blood and he presents himself as a gift to us. And he says, I am Emmanuel. I am the God who is with you. Right? So, and this is what Christmas is about, right? This is the story of Christmas. That God has come. God has come in the flesh. And Jesus is God. So the question is like, you know, maybe I'm speaking to the choir here, but, but do you really believe that? Because, man, that makes all the difference, right? It makes all the difference that Jesus is God and he is with us, right? Do you believe that? You know, and, and here's, the, here's the thing, right? Uh, when you study the biblical accounts of the Christmas story, uh, when you read the story of Jesus' birth, like, it's anything but an ordinary story, right? Like, this is not your regular birth story. I mean, uh, we, we like to tell our birth story with our youngest daughter because I got to birth her and it was amazing and it's a story and we've told it to hundreds of people. But like this story, like it's nothing like that, right? This is a crazy story. I mean, we read it over and over, year after year, we get so familiar with it. But this is not an ordinary story, right? This is like a supernatural, crazy, crazy story. You know, you know it was like, you know, Jesus... God is birthed through a virgin birth, right? Like, that's nuts. Like, come on. That's crazy, right? Like, you can't deny this is anything but ordinary. Because Jesus was anything but ordinary, right? We, we just read it like that definition of the incarnation. Fully God. Like, the, the, the entire power that, that speaks forth creation into existence in a word, right? And fully human, with all your propensities, weaknesses, challenges that you and I have, fully human. Like it wasn't like, you know, this is sometimes I used to think Jesus was kind of like Clark Kent. Anyone ever thought like Jesus was Clark Kent? Anyone? Like, you know, he was like Clark Kent on the outside, but underneath he was Jesus, right? And he just had to rip off the spectacles and like rip off the tie and then he was Superman, right? That's not what Jesus did, right? Let, let me read to you for how Paul describes this incarnation, this incredibly emptying that took place. He says, though he was God, he was God, the fullness of deity, right? 
He did not think of equality with God something to cling to, but instead he gives up his divine privileges. He takes on the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being, and he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. So he empties himself so that he might be exalted by the Father. Paul continues, he says, therefore God exalts him from that place to, of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And why did he do that? For you. For me, for the sake of love, for the sake of love, that we could be with him forever and ever and ever. That God's place, his dwelling is now with man, and he will be our God, and we'll be his people, right? So Jesus is unlike anyone who has ever lived, right? He is no ordinary man, he is the God man. Now think about that, right? I mean, all across this planet, right? Billions and billions of people, right? In a week's time, we'll celebrate the birth of this man. Like, that's crazy. A birth that took place some oh, 2,000 odd years ago. Why? Because he was not an ordinary man, right? He was not an ordinary man. He was, an, he was not just an extraordinary teacher. He was not just an extraordinary philosopher. He wasn't just an extraordinary, excellent human being. No, no. He was God. He is God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel. And he is God who is with us. And so the story of, of Jesus' birth is not an ordinary story. It's a supernatural story. Now, many of you know this story. Right? Now, let me just reflect on it with you. Uh, a little bit. Some 2,000 years ago, right, in the small little podunk town, right, of Nazareth, a town that no one believed anything good would come from. It was kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> Kay and I, I don't know. No. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say something, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm not going to, it's not your town, someone else's town, but some little town no one thought anything good would come out of, right? And there in this little town is, is this young girl, like a teenage girl, maybe just barely a teenager, 14, 16 years old, right? We would just still consider her a child, but in that day, she was a young woman, right? And then one day, an angel shows up. Like, if you were here last week, like, an angel showed up to Paul in the middle of a storm, remember? Like, that's crazy, like an angel. And not like any angel, this is like the archangel Gabriel. Like, I don't know what Gabriel looks like, but I got some questions. I, I, like, I think about this stuff, I don't know if you think about this stuff. So I got all day, I only pre, you know, preach twice a week, so like this is, I, all day long I think about this sort of stuff. Like Gabriel, what did he look like, right? Gabriel, the angel, he shows up, right? And he says to her, like, greetings, favored woman of God, right? The Lord is with you. What? <laughs> I mean, that's crazy, right? Like, that's not normal. That's not something that happens every day. You know, like, that's like a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. Great, well, it shows up. You know, we know the story of, of, of Mary, right? You didn't show up again, as far as we know, from the biblical narrative. Like, one time in her life, this angel shows up, and he says, Favored woman of God, the Lord is with you. And what do you think Mary's reaction was? What would your reaction be? She's, like, terrified. She's, like, troubled. She's disturbed. She's, like, what on earth is going on? This is not normal. Like, who are you? I'm Gabriel. And so he says, Mary, you're going to have a son. Right? And you're not going to just have a, any son. You're going to have the son of God. You're like, what? You're going to have the son of God. God. And you're going to call him Jesus. 
So Luke tells us the angel said he'll be very great and he'll be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestors David and he will reign over Israel forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. And I imagine like Mary's got a thousand questions and I got a thousand questions and I wasn't even there, right? I'm like, what on earth, right? But Mary asked the one most obvious question, right? She's like, how can this happen? I'm a virgin, right? Like, I don't know much. I'm a young girl, but I know how this whole thing works, right? And I ain't been, you know, sleeping around. I'm a virgin, right? How's this gonna happen? And Gabriel answers, he says this, is the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Someone say overshadow. Will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born and he will be called the Son of God. Like this is wild. Like this is not a normal occurrence, right? This is kind of a supernatural moment in time and space, in history. You know that, that word overshadowed, it's, it's a beautiful word. It's made up of two Greek words, epi, kaizo. And, and listen to this definition in this context. It's the manifestation of God's power where the natural laws are canceled out in obedience to God who is spirit. God will epi kaizo you. He will overshadow you. You know, and I imagine God is still overshadowing us today. You know, sometimes in our lives, like I've asked this question, how will it be? Like, how on earth is this going to work out? And I think God's response is the same way. By the power of the Holy Spirit. I am Emmanuel. I am with you. And my power will epikaizo you. Will overshadow you. Like, how's my marriage going to survive? By the power of the Holy Spirit that overshadows you. Because I'm a God who is with you. Right? How, how will I survive this financial nightmare I'm in? By the power of the Holy Spirit who overshadows you. I am God who is with you. I think the response that God would have to us when we ask the question, how will this be? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Because I am a God who is with you. I am Emmanuel. And so Mary's response is just beautiful. She's like, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything that you have said about this come true. Okay, so I guess I'm going to go tell my fiance now, right? Joe, you and I, we can have a conversation. I mean, I don't know how this worked. I'm just imagining. But can you imagine how that conversation would have gone? She's like, Joe, why don't we go grab a coffee, buy to eat something, just a little time together. I got some good news. Actually, I don't know if you'll think it's good, but I've got news. You know, and they're sitting down, and she's like, oh, Joe, oh, guess what? And he's like, what, Mary? I'm pregnant. You what? I'm pregnant. She's like, who was it? I'll kill him. You know, I don't know. This is me. I'm not sure Joe was probably more, more reserved than I am. And Mary's like, no, 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 Joe, you, you don't understand. I'm, I'm having God's baby. Mm, I'm having God's baby. Gabriel came to me. Power of the Holy Spirit overshadowed me. Baby in my womb. It's God's baby, Joe. And he's like, can you just imagine how that conversation went? Or, or she went to her parents, right? Teenage pregnant girl, mom, dad. We sit down, I've got some news for you. I'm pregnant. Don't worry, though. It's God's baby. Like, Joe is probably, yeah, right, right? And we know from the biblical text, he doesn't believe her. Like, who would, right? Who would? And so, Matthew tells us, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, verse 19, and yet did not want to expose her to public grace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph, who was faithful to the law. In other words, he was a good man. He was a good Jewish boy, right? You know, he he was raised in the Torah. He understood the law of God. Which is crazy because if Joseph was faithful to the law, you know what the law would have dictated for Mary? Death. The assumption was she was pregnant 
It wasn't with her betrothed Joseph, which means she probably committed adultery. And the penalty for adultery was what? Death by stoning. This is how high the Jewish people held the sacrament of marriage. But Joseph, right, was also full of mercy. And so he decides he doesn't want to expose her to public disgrace. And so he will divorce her quietly. Joseph chooses mercy over judgment. He chooses grace over the law. I mean, don't miss that. That is profound. Like, I wondered, like, what was it about Joseph, right? That God would say, of all the people on the planet, right, I'm going to pick Mary and I'm going to pick this guy to be, you know, my son's earthly father. And I think this was it. I mean, who better to raise a child? You know, what did John say? Jesus came what? Full of grace and truth. Jesus, completely obedient and faithful to the law of God, yet with such exceeding, abundant, extravagant grace that he would save wretched sinners like you and I, deserving of death. And who better, right, to father the one full of grace and mercy, the one who demonstrates in this moment both grace and truth. I love this story. I love this story. This is not an ordinary story, right? This is a supernatural story. Yeah. And so, Joseph goes to bed, and we told <laughs> in the middle of the night, Gabriel, right? Gabriel, angel of God, shows up in a dream, and he's like, yo, Joe. Probably didn't say it that way. This is Sean's paraphrase. Yo, Joe, right? She's telling the truth, right? She's telling the truth. She's pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit who has epikaised her. He has overshadowed her. He has superseded and canceled out the natural law. And what is birthed in her womb now is the very son of God. And we're told by Matthew, that when Joseph woke from the sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife. He knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Jesus. Now, I thought about that story, too. I'm like, okay. I'm not sure a dream would have done it for me. Like, I don't care, like, if an angel shows up in my dream. Because, like, you face it, you've probably had dreams that were so vivid and so real, and then you wake up and you go like, Oh, that was crazy. That was wild. But it was a dream, right? It was a dream, right? So I'm like, I don't know, like if an angel showing up to me telling me that my wife was pregnant by the Holy Spirit and that I need to marry her and take that child to be my own, that I'm just going to go like, sure, that sounds like a plan. Let's do that, right? I, I actually think there was something else going on here. What, what did it say about Joseph? He was faithful to the law, right? In other words, he was a man who was raised and seeped in the Torah, in the word of God, right? And he would have known the writings of the prophets, right? And he must have connected the dots because Isaiah, some 780 odd years before, had prophesied this very thing. He had said, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign and the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. And I'm going like, man, Joseph's connecting some dots now. Not only has he received the spoken word of God from an angel, but he knows the written word of God. And the two things are connecting, and he's going like, man, I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe. It doesn't make sense. It's crazy. It's supernatural. But I'm going to believe. And so he does what no other man probably would have done. He takes Mary to be his wife, and he raises Jesus as his own. So we know from this text so far, like we know Mary believed, right? Mary believed the supernatural, that this, this child growing in my womb is supernaturally conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and I know it's supernatural because I haven't been with a man, right? Mary had evidence to believe. Joseph had the spoken word of God and the written word of God, and he believed, right? So how about you, right? Do you believe, right, that Jesus is God? Not a baby in a manger, not a great teacher, not a great philosopher, but God, 
Do you believe that he's God? You know, I mean, think about this, right? These are his parents, right? Said, like, what would it take for you to convince your parents that you were God? <laughs> right? I mean, like, I thought, like, I've joked about this with James because James, his brother, right? He, he eventually believed. He didn't at first, but eventually he believed after the resurrection, right? Which makes sense, right? That it would take something radical for you to believe, right? I mean, like, I could fool a lot of people. Like, you might look at Sean and go, like, oh, he's pastor. You know, he's a, he's a godly man. He might not be God, but maybe he's a godly man, right? But, like, if you speak to those that are closest to me, like my mom, who I kind of was a little snotty about just today. Um, you know, my girls, who I've done some dumb things, said some dumb things, done some dumb things too. They'd be like, yeah, he's a decent guy. <laughs> not God. <laughs> Definitely not God, right? Definitely not God, right? So wait, but here we know that, that Mary believed. You know that song, we, I love a song, Mary, did you know? She knew. She knew what she was carrying. She believed. Joseph believed, and the evidence of it is that he took Mary to be his wife, and he raised Jesus as his son, never once exposing any kind of shame or disgrace or any kind of shaming. Joseph, from we can tell from the biblical account, was an exemplary father. So the question is, like for us, right, do we truly believe that Jesus is God? This miracle of the incarnation, right? God wrapping himself in flesh and blood and bones. And he comes to be with us. But he doesn't just come to be with us. He comes to save us and to redeem us, right? Jesus said of himself, the son of man, which was a messianic title, traced all the way back to the prophet Daniel. The son of man, he came to seek and to save the lost. And in case you're wondering who the lost are, that's us, right? We're all lost, right? The prophet Isaiah would say, we're all, all of us are like sheep. We've gone astray, each one to his own way. There's a way that seems right to man, but it leads to death. We're all like sheep have wandered from the ways of God. Right? And Jesus came to get us back. Jesus came to save us. But in order to be saved by Jesus, you have to believe in Jesus, right? You have to believe in Jesus. You know, and the crazy thing is, 2,000 years later, Jesus is still in the business of saving. He is still in the business of seeking and redeeming and restoring and bringing people back to himself. But we have to pause and stop, right? We need to have eyes to see and ears to hear and our minds open to understand and our hearts open to believe. Jesus is still in the business of saving people. But we can only be saved by Jesus if we believe in Jesus. You know, and I, I don't know where all of us are here today. I don't know all your stories, and I wouldn't presume to know your story, even if I know you, right? Um, but I, I suspect that some of us, we've been running from Jesus. And maybe not in every aspect of our lives, but there's certain aspects of our life that Jesus is after. And we've been running. We've been dodging. We've been hiding. And Jesus is still pursuing. And he's coming after you. Because he is Emmanuel. He's a God who is with you. Right? There's some of you here today, man. Um, maybe you're, you're just, you're alone, right? I mean, again, I don't know your stories, all your stories. You might be in a family, but you feel alone. Um, and Jesus sees you, right? And most importantly, he is with you. He is a God who is with you, right? Which means you're never alone. You're never alone. And he wants to heal you and restore you and establish you in family, in himself. He's Emmanuel, a God who is with us. You know, th there are a lot of responses that we can have to Jesus. And I think I know for myself in my different seasons of my life, I've responded to Jesus in different ways. Um, 
you know, and so we have a lot of different responses to Jesus. But I think the one response from I, what I can tell in the scriptures that Jesus will not tolerate from us is a lukewarm response. Right? Like you cannot dabble with Jesus. Like you, you can't just like come to church and just like do a little Jesus, like Jesus on the side, Jesus plus this and Jesus plus that. Like he's just, he won't have that. Right? You can hate him. Or you can love him, right? Either you, you can totally reject him or you have to be all in with him, right? That, like there's no middle ground with Jesus. You know, he is God, God in the flesh, you know? You know, and if he's not, it means that, that he, he, was, he was a madman. He, he literally a lunatic who had a, a Messiah complex, a God complex, or he was an absolute, like, charlatan who has perpetuated the biggest hoax in human history. Or, maybe, just maybe, he is Lord. And every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Right. You know, Jesus is God. And for many people, that's a stumbling block, right? Like, this is the controversial message of Christmas, and which is crazy to me because so many people celebrate Christmas, but what they're celebrating is the fact that God is with us in the person of Jesus Christ, right? And so they kind of dabble with Jesus. You know, they all celebrate Jesus and, you know, and put up a Christmas tree and maybe sing a Christmas carol, but never truly bend their knee and confess him as Lord, right? And the response is lukewarm, right? But if Jesus is God, right? Then Christmas takes on a whole new meaning. Right? It takes on a whole new meaning. It's much more than just another holiday. It's much more than just twinkle lights and gifts and, and singing Christmas carols. It means that Jesus is God and he has come to be with us. And not just to be with us, but to redeem us and to save us. And that he has a plan for your life and my life. He has purpose for you and he has purpose for me. You know, Christmas is about this reality of God leaving the throne room of heaven. right, Wrapping himself in flesh and blood and bone. And coming to earth to be with us to save us. And here's the good news, right? If you can wrap your head around that, that Jesus is God, and you can wrap your mind around that, uh, and if you have faith to believe, then this next point is the most miraculous, most beautiful thing that you'll ever hear. That Jesus is God. And here's the second part. He is with you. He's with you. I mean, he is with you right now. He is with you. Jesus is God. And he came to save you. And he is with you. And it's even better than that. He not only came to get you, but he gets you. Like, he gets you. Like, have you ever felt, like, misunderstood in your life? Like, I think this is one of the worst things. I mean, I know, like, Jess gets mad at me at this point. When I try to assume that I know what's going on, and I kind of just don't get her. Like, she says something, and I assume something else, and she gets frustrated at me because I don't get it. Anyone ever felt that way about yourself? People just don't get you? Jesus didn't come just to get you, but he gets you. Like he gets you. Like he totally knows you. I mean, like this is one of the most beautiful and miraculous realities of this, this truth that God is with us. He is Emmanuel. And he has come to save us, to get us back to himself. But he also gets you. <coughs> he gets you. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever kind of been through a, like a really difficult time. 
in life and, and, and it's been a hard and it's strug- you struggled and then someone comes up and, they try- and you know they're trying to just encourage you, be nice to you, and they say something just like, pithy or like they give you a scripture like you can do all things in Christ and and you just like uh you're like you don't get it like you don't know what I'm going through you don't know my pain right now right like what happened to your puppy is not what is happening to me right now right I mean I've, I've literally I've heard people say that like they've compared like a loss of a child to when they lost their puppy and you're like are, are you insane like you don't get it right you don't get it and I think sometimes we feel that way right where people just don't get us like, you haven't walked in my shoes. You don't know what I'm going through. You've not experienced what I'm experiencing right now. But you know that Jesus gets you? Like, he really gets you? You know, look what the author of Hebrew writes. He says this. He says, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize. Someone say sympathize. You know, in the Greek, it's kind of like this, this guttural, heart-wrenching, gut-like connection. Like, oh, I feel your pain. Like, I feel it. Literally feel it in the bowels of my stomach. I feel what you're going through. I know what you, it is that you're dealing with right now. Without weakness, right? And he has been tempted in every respect, yet without sin. This is who Jesus is. He is a God who is with you, but he's also a God who gets you. Right? He gets you. He knows you. He understands, right? You know, he's not a distant God who is sitting up in a heaven just kind of waiting to drop the hammer, right? He's a God who wraps himself in flesh and bone and blood and he steps into the mess and the muck of your life and my life and he, and he deals with us and walks with us and feels with us and sympathizes with us and understands us. He gets us. He knows us intimately is a God who is with us. He is Emmanuel, right? A God who is with us. You know, again, like this Christmas story, right? It's a wild story. Like we get so used to it and so familiar with the story that we just kind of miss the the power and the supernatural nature of the story, right? I mean, just kind of think about like, the whole birth thing, right? I mean, for those of you who have parents who've, you know, experienced the birth of a child, that's crazy, right? I mean, like, I, I don't know how women actually go through that process. It's pretty phenomenal to me. Um, and they still kind of do it again and again. I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm not joking. Jess had such a hard pregnancy with, with our fr- first goal, PK. It took her six years before she was willing to have another baby. Like, it was, she was terrified. I mean, I know for some women it's different. It's not always the same. But, I mean, like, it was hard, right? And I even remember when, when Jess was, like, pregnant, like, those last months, oh, they're miserable. Like, I mean, I don't know. Some of you are better at this, I guess. Maybe, you know. But I know for Jess it was hard, right? And, and so, like, this Christmas story, right? Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> Mary is, like, she's, like, nine months pregnant. And then they have to travel, like, on a donkey, to Bethlehem, from Nazareth to Bethlehem, like 80 miles. Like, so let me just, I'll read the story. Like, otherwise you think I'm going to make this stuff up, right? In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census would be taken in the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor. Sorry, I love this. I love Luke, right? He gives you so many details, right? He's an historian. He's like, go check the facts. You know, like you don't think, this, think I'm making this stuff up? Check the history books, right? Line it up with history. These are places, these are people that existed in, in real time and place. And, and, and so he says, and so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, to, uh, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of, on, and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, and he was pledged to be married, to, to, he was pledged to marry and was expecting a child. Luke's very nonchalant. But we know, right, because by the time they get to Bethlehem, what happens? Mary has a baby, right? So what means, like, that while they were traveling in that journey, most people said, we well, probably would have taken somewhere between, you know, four or five days on a donkey, right? Can you imagine nine months pregnant, ladies? I mean, if you've been pregnant, nine months pregnant, traveling four or five days on a donkey. Like, are you kidding? Like, this is a crazy story, right? On a donkey. You know, she's, like, ready to depart. Um, that's the context, And here's the son of God, right? God in her womb, right? Bumping along on a donkey, right? To this little town of Bethlehem. 
You know, like, and I think, like, why on earth would God send his son like that way? I mean, there could have been a million different ways, like a million different scenarios that you could think of. Like, he could have been born into a palace. He could have been born, you know, a million ways. You could come up with all kinds of different ways, much more comfortable, much easier than this, right? Because he is the God who is with us. Not only a God who is with us, but a God who gets us, right? The God who says, I understand you. I get you. I've been where you've been. I have literally walked the streets that you have walked. I, I've been in the circumstances that you've been in. I get you, right? I know your pain. I know your tribulation. I'm Emmanuel. I am the God who's with you, right? And so when a, you know, Mary and Joseph eventually arrive, right, in the, in the city, a little town of Bethlehem, right, they poor, so poor and destitute, they, they can't find a place to, to stay, right? And I don't know if it's because they couldn't, like, they didn't pull out enough gold at that time, or whether there just wasn't a place to stay. I mean, it seems like there just wasn't even room for them, right? There was no room for them to stay, right? And, and when I think about that, I mean, you think about, like, all the people on our island, right, that, that are homeless. I know we have a ministry down in Paya, and there's, there's all kinds of reasons why people are homeless, but I know there are a lot of people who right now, like, good people have great jobs, good families that are struggling to find homes. Jesus gets you, right? Like he was homeless at his birth. No place for him to, he ends up like in a, in a cave where animals are kept. Th that's where he's born. They say a manger, that sounds really fancy. Manger was probably a hole in a rock somewhere. Jesus gets you. He understands. Right. You know, some of you, you know, are, are looking around and you go like, man, Pastor, you don't understand, right? You talk about this good tidings of great joy, Christmas season, but right now in the season of life that I'm in, right, like I've got nothing, right? I, I can't even afford to pay rent. I, I can't afford to kind of like, you know, put a roof over my head. Jesus gets you, right? Jesus gets you. You understand? He is a God who is with us. He has come to save you, to bring you back to himself, but he also understands you. He gets you. You know, maybe you're sitting here in this room today and you're looking around and you go like, man, you guys look like you all got good families. You don't understand the home that I came from. Like, my household, like, was so broken, so messed. I don't even know who my father is. You know, and, and I look around the room and I go like, man, you guys are like all happy homes. And, you know, and I'm like, think about Jesus, right? Think about the story of Jesus, right? Jesus was, you know, raised in this little town of Nazareth. You know, little towns, if you've ever been in a small town, like, people in small towns can be really gossipy. Have you ever noticed that? They, like, just know everyone's business. Like, so Joseph tried to, you know, protect Mary from disgrace. But I guarantee you there were rumors. I guarantee you there were rumors. Jesus on the playground. Little kids huddling, go like, Jesus. Joseph's not his real dad. <laughs> can you believe it? Mary said the Holy Spirit, <laughs> Holy Spirit came and overshadowed her. I know what overshadowed her. Yeah, I mean, I can just think of like little junior high kids just poking fun at Jesus. Like, Joseph's not even his dad. Like, you know, and Jesus would have lived with that. You know, Jesus' family was like, it was a broken family. It was a mixed family. You know, it wasn't a perfect family. Jesus understands, right? You know, for all of those who think, man, man, if you knew my background, you knew my past, if you knew where I came from, I mean, have you ever read the lineage of Jesus? Like, they're prostitutes. There's like, man, he's like, it's not like he came from this perfect background. Jesus understands, right? He understands the shame of failure in our past and our generational brokenness, in our present, the brokenness of our families. He's walked in your shoes, right? He gets you. He gets you. Um, you know, and, and then you think of how the life of Jesus ends, Right? I mean, he is betrayed by his best friends, right? Judas, who literally sells him out for a bag of gold or silver. Peter, the guy, he's like, you're the rock, Peter. You're my guy. You know, a little girl comes to him after Jesus' rest and says, like, you know, the moon you with Jesus? Like, I don't even know the guy. Denies him, not once, not twice, three times. Like, he's betrayed, He's marginalized, he's mistreated, he's abused, beaten, right? misrepresented. They twist his words. If you feel any of those things, Jesus felt them. Right? 
and ultimately he's arrested, right? Sentenced to death, but not just any death, like a crucifixion, right? a brutal death. You know, why? Because this was God's plan for him. Right? This is why he came. As Gabriel said, right, he will forgive the people of their sins. And the only way he could pay the price was to take upon himself what you and I deserved. And so he dies for us in love, for love, so that you can be with him. I mean, this is a wild, wild and beautiful story, right? Jesus is God, and he is a God who is with us, a God who gets us. You know, and if the story just ended there, it would be a tragedy. It would be a beautiful tragedy. But the story doesn't end there, right? They put him in a tomb, but the tomb does not hold him, right? And three days later, he resurrects out of that tomb. And the reason he does it is so that you and I might know that there is nothing, right? There is nothing. There's nothing in this earth and on this earth or under this earth, in the heavens and all the galaxies, that can separate you from the love of God, of this God who declares himself to be Emmanuel, a God who is with you, who is with you. So here's the question I want to leave you with this, this Christmas season. Do you really believe that? Do you believe that? Because if you believe that, man, it changes everything. It changes everything. You know, there, there are a couple of questions that I want you to consider um, this Christmas season as we, as we kind of wind our up or down. I don't know how you do it in your house towards Christmas, but um, I'm only going to just put one to you, but they're in your notes. You can look at them and maybe ponder them uh, th this week. Uh, but one question here. So the question I've been asking is, do you believe that Jesus is God? Right? Like God, the creator of heaven and earth, Right? The one who spoke forth existence in a word, let there be light, and there was light. He brought forth uh, creation that all we see and all we know, all things were created in him and through him and by him and for him. God, who is with you, right? With you, Christian. Right? Do you believe that? And if you believe that, right, then what limitations, listen, listen, what limitations are you placing on your life right now? If you have a God who is with you, right? Like, like what, what are you not stepping into? What, what, what fear is holding you back? What, what did the angel Mary say, say to, to, sorry, the angel Gabriel say to Mary? Don't be afraid. The Lord is with you, right? If ever there's a reason not to be afraid and to be brave, it's because God is with you, right? And so, so what is it, right, in your life right now? What limitations are you imposing upon your life? Because when it really comes down to it, you're not really sure that God, God is with you. And I, I want you to just uh, listen. I want to wrap this up with a spoken word, a poem that I thought was really powerful. I think it applies, so <laughs> why don't you roll, roll that video. I'll come back and I'll wrap us up here. An unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. Fear. Or to simply put it, fear is the belief that God is not with you, you of little faith. You see, the interesting thing about fear is that even though it's like a shadow and accompanies you wherever you go, fear is a choice. Yeah, I said it, fear is a choice. It's a choice between saying yes in the face of opposition when you can't see the rationale or living with the regret of not trying or remaining crippled with the lies you're too busy buying. And without doing the math, we all already know what the common choice is because we walk around like cats who have nine lives, believing that we could be brave in the next life, but why are we never brave enough for today? We always say tomorrow, and hope by tomorrow fear will be gone but god tells us tomorrow isn't even promised and that's where we've all gone wrong he wants us to be brave today brave right now 
check this. The voice of fear will always be present in situations where there's an opportunity to be brave. See, even Peter, who walked with the Savior himself, almost said yes to bravery until the waves of fear began to wave at him and he was no longer sure if Jesus was with him anymore. So he sunk and fear won. You of little faith. See, that's how it works. Bravery is simply an exchange, an exchange of fear for faith. And our faith in Jesus comes with a peace, an inner peace that defies all fears, a peace that confronts, not one that backs up or backs out, but a peace that comes with bravery, bravery to say peace, be still in the face of insecurities, in the face of opposition, in the face of the uncertainties of the deeper places and saying yes. Yes to standing at the shore, embracing yourself for the exceedingly and abundantly more that we ever so often pray for. And when it comes, going head first into the deepest of the unknowns. This is bravery. Remembering that fear keeps us stuck, but grace whispers freedom. Fear shouts doubt, but grace sings peace. Fear talks you are alone, but grace declares my name is Emmanuel with you and in the midst of all those fears grace chance you are not crippled you are not weak you are not worthless you are not inadequate grace chance you are brave amen pray with me heavenly father heavenly father my god emmanuel you're with us you're with us, Lord. I pray this Christmas season that reality would sink to the very deepest recesses of our hearts and our souls. And Lord, it would bring forth a life that is brave, that is bold, that is courageous. Father, I pray for each and every one of my friends and my family here tonight, Father. I pray right now that you would fill us with the emboldening power of your spirit that you would epicize to us, that you would overshadow us with the power of the Holy Spirit, Father. Come bring this reality to life that we serve a God who is with us, who has redeemed us and has saved us and has given us the very same spirit that raised him from the dead. Lord, you are with us. You are with us. You are with us. You're with us. Let that truth resonate in the very deepest recesses of our hearts and our souls. We worship you. We worship you. You are the God who is with us.